the reason why I'm harping on this experience thing is the fact that I believe that we have to draw a line or a distinction between what is uh, real, you know, conventionally real, and what we perceive and our perceptions, our experience of that. Um, the two, I believe, are related in a way, but I don't think that they're connected in such a quantifiable way as we seem to think. As I say, um, just because I know that something is an incorrect perception or a, a garbled um, or distorted view of what my senses are trying to tell me doesn't mean that I don't experience something. Uh, as I said, the obvious example of that is I drop acid, I look in the mirror, and my face melts. Okay, I come down off the acid and I go, oh, my face didn't melt. Ah, okay. But in a way, I'm, I've been subtly altered by that experience in, in a way that just understanding what happened isn't going to change. A nasty version of that is um, someone who has something traumatic happen to them. Uh, let's say that, um, I don't know, some weird series of events sees me land in a torture chamber. I get tortured for several days, my head's held underwater, or uh, I have uh, my feet put to the fire, literally, or whatever. Um, okay, I come out, my body recovers. Uh, I understand what had happened. I understand what my, uh, what my senses were doing when that was taking place. But the effects of that experience are far more profound than just overt uh, understanding of what was taking place. So your experiences count, and your experiences um, leave marks on you. That simple knowledge of the external reality can't really um, break through to. Now this is important if you ask me. Um, a while back I did a hundred plus videos on the subject of antinatalism and its connection to depression. You can tell somebody a hundred thousand times when they are in a state of depression that what you have is a pathological condition that can be explained, uh, it can be treated, but the experience of being depressed is far more profound than that. Um, all the explanations in the world, all the people telling you that you're in error, won't alter that. Um, you're simply in a place where things can't get through to you. Um, where people people's attempts to explain things correctly to you, uh, or correctly, um, don't reach you. Uh, people are trying to tell you, look, this life isn't just hell. This uh, um, uh, Existence really isn't all that bad. Look around you. You have enough to eat. You have a job. You have a wife. You have a life. You have all this kind of thing. And um, what you're, re how you're reacting to that is illogical because we know that X, Y, and Z make people happy. You're not happy, so something has gone a bit wonky here. It's perishing hard to get through to somebody who's in that state. In some cases, I can imagine it's impossible, and such people's lives are probably irrevocably wrecked. It's unfortunate, but that does strike me as um, something that's probably inevitable, uh, given uh, the nature and the impenetrability of the human mind and the human consciousness and the human experience. There are certain barriers between the internal and the external that you can't smash through. As I say, you can't experience someone else's experience. I, you know, even if you could somehow read their mind, um, I can't see a situation in which you would see the world exactly the way that they see it. Because we don't just see things in a gross physical sense. We put an infinite number of values on everything that we ever see at all times, uh, you know, and it takes place in real time. That's an experience. Now. The reason why I'm bringing this up is the fact that some people have thought that what I'm, or have assumed or whatever, that what I'm referring to here is a solipsistic view of the universe, or a, or a solipsistic 
view of existence or consciousness. No, not really, not at all. What I'm saying is, um, just because that we can't know things from the outside doesn't mean that there's not an enormous amount of work that we can accomplish within the limitations of the system that we're operating in. I know, for example, what depression is. And I know how impenetrable it is. That strikes me as about as real as something can get. Um, but I also know what happiness is. Now, a lot of people seem to think that pleasure and all this sort of thing is just some sort of Darwinian motivation to do stuff. Uh, you feel good because when you do this, it increases your chances of, of move, uh, passing on your DNA. And when you do this, it decreases the likelihood of that happening. Well, yes and no. If you've ever uh, had a surfeit of pleasure, in other words, you're the fat Roman sitting there getting fed grapes um, by uh, a whole bevy of gorgeous naked babes and you've got as much wine as you want and everything is wonderful and you're in a constant state of massage and uh, whatever, after a while that wears off, all the pleasure in the world turns to crap. Um, but happiness doesn't seem to have that effect. Um, the pleasure of gross physical pleasures cannot um, meet your need for the experience of happiness. But happiness can meet your experience of the need for happiness. Um, gross um, evidence of being miserable and being sad does not necessarily mean you are sad or depressed. Some people who are in a situation that I would find hopelessly depressing are quite patently not depressed. In fact, they might be perfectly well-adjusted, happy people. I don't have I, I don't have any way of gauging that. Uh, I don't I can't experience what they're experiencing. I don't know what this world thing means to them, and I. You know, as far as I know, I can't know. So, the fundamental value of existence is all in here. Um, the values that we place on everything, the interpretation, the experience of it all, is all taking place in here. But it's still happening. Solipsism, in my understanding, or at least the way that it's normally used as sort of a charge against somebody, is that you don't know anything and you can't know anything, so just give up. Well, no, <laughs> that's <laughs> I'm not advocating that. What I'm saying is, only go with what you're sure of, um, in terms of at least your overall picture. Um, go with the things that you can actually uh, deal with and analyze things to the best of your knowledge. Um, in other words, I know that when I'm in a state of black depression, or even worse, what they call white depression, that I'm in a place that I don't want to be. It's probably the worst place in the world. When I'm happy, I know that this is where I want to be. But what puts me there, <laughs> that's another matter entirely. And it's this disconnect between the internal and the external that makes people so terrified of the charge of if it is a charge, solipsism. Um, I don't see, however, um, that this disconnect is necessarily a bad thing, because again, you can say, all right, no matter how bad things get outside, I might be pretty good inside. I've already been in a case where no matter how, how good things are on the outside, I'm bad on the inside. That's, as I say, that's just depression. That's the kind of depression that simply won't respond to anything, and I've been there. I've also been in a place where I'm happy, even though, you know, you sort of, if someone else from the outside looked at my life, they would say, well, you have a rather boring, pointless life, and what makes you so happy? You shouldn't be happy. Shouldn't be happy, that's kind of a dumb thing to say, but it's equally dumb to say that I shouldn't be depressed. So there are things that even solipsism can't rule out. Um, I guess maybe my attitude would be sort of solipsism plus or um, semi-solipsism because even within the bounds of not knowing anything about the external reality, I know enough about reality itself to know that there are certain things, there are certain states that I'm in that I want to maintain and certain states that I don't want to maintain. 
ultimately that might be enough. <laughs> Thank you.